Welcome to the Nashua Area Radio Society's Tech Night. I'm Scott Anderson, NE1RD. I'm going to assume that you're new to antenna modeling and possibly not that familiar with some of the things we measure and do to evaluate antennas. In other words, I'll be taking it slow at first. Uh, let's get started. I'll cover the following things tonight. First, I'll discuss the most basic characteristics of an antenna. Our model will need to capture all the details in order to provide meaningful report on the proposed antenna's performance. Next, I'll discuss some of the more widely used software for antenna modeling. This includes EasyNeck for Windows and CocoNeck for Macintosh. There are Linux alternatives too, but I'll not be including those details. Have no fear though. For all the things you'll learn tonight, we'll apply equally to those software, p uh, so software things as well. Next, we need to talk about geometry a bit. In order to model an antenna, we need to describe its geometric characteristics and the characteristics of its construction. We'll do this first with a simple dipole. Many of us who first hung an antenna hung a dipole, so why not let that be the first thing we model? Then we'll actually model a few antennas using both EasyNeck and CocoNeck. Again, we'll start with dipoles, eventually moving to more complicated antennas, learning about other features of Neck in the process. Just a bit of history. NEC was first developed by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the 70s. It's the power behind the antenna modeling software we're going to discuss. It doesn't have much of a user interface. When it was first designed, it was written in a language called FORTRAN, which stands for Formula Translation, and it ran on giant computers that filled whole rooms. The code has been ported many times to run on newer hardware, including PCs and Macs today, and even though the program is old and still thinks it's getting character, uh, 80 character Hollerith punch cards as input, it's still pretty good. We'll talk about the antenna modeling products and the ones that we'll be discussing uh, use this bit of technology. It's an old program and design, but it does a good job so it stays relevant. You can visit the Wikipedia page for a very reasonable and readable introduction to its history. The NEC engine, along with a nice user interface, can produce some fantastic reports and beautiful diagrams that will give you a very good idea of how your antenna will perform. But there are a number of things that you must understand before you can use the program effectively. Next, going to throw a lot of numbers at you. Each number is meaning is straightforward once you know what it is. Uh, so we'll go through them one at a time. So think of this next part as Antennas 101. So stay with me, it'll be over soon. By the way, if you're working on your general class ticket, you'll need to know some of this. And if you're working on your extra class tickets, you really need to know all of this. So think of this as a mini license upgrade course. So first, first let's talk about antenna characteristics. If we're describing a dipole, We'll need to be able to provide specifics about its length, the type of material we use for its radiator, the position of the feed point. Note you don't have to feed a feed dipole in the middle. The height above the ground and the ground characteristics. So why does the ground need to be described? Because unless the antenna is so far away from the ground that the antenna can't see it, the ground becomes part of the antenna system. It affects efficiency and the direction of radiation. Thankfully, the modeling software provides uh, some easy ways to specify what the ground looks like. Antennas are usually constructed for a particular frequency, band, or set of bands. Any given antenna will change its behavior as the frequency varies. Uh, two of the biggest changes appear in the feed point impedance. Uh, the feed point impedance, usually called Z or Z0, is the total number of ohms presented to the signal generator, like your transceiver. I'll cover this in detail in a minute. The takeoff angle is the angle above the horizon where most of the radiation is released. We'll go over this when we look at neck output. Next, we need to specify the frequencies that we're interested in to, pursue, to produce meaningful results in our model. Here are three concepts uh, that we need to understand in order to understand feed point impedance, and this is key to understanding the output of neck and these antenna modeling programs. Resistance, reactance, and impedance. So these three concepts are, there's resistance, it's a term we use to describe the opposition of current flow in a circuit as the energy is converted to heat and radiation. We like when it's converted to radiation, that's the point of the exercise, of course. Reactance is a term we use to describe the opposition to a change in current or voltage in an AC circuit. It doesn't produce any radiation, it's just in the way. Impedance is the combination of these two things. It defines the total opposition to the current flow. So there are two kinds of reactants. 
There's inductive reactance when a current change across the device is, oppo is opposed, and capacitive reactance when the voltage uh, change across the device is imposed. And you may have heard of inductors and capacitors. Those are little parts that you can actually mount that do exactly this thing in a circuit. Alright, this is a lot to unpack, so let me try to shed a little light on this with an example. Imagine a garden hose connected to a lawn sprinkler. The water is running. We call running water a current. So the hose would love to run lots and lots of water through itself, like 80 gallons an hour if it could, but there's resistance from the sprinkler head as it moves the sprayer and forces water through tiny little holes so the water uh, can water the lawn. It's doing the work so we don't mind. Now imagine I pick up the hose and squeeze it. There's now less current. My hand squeezing the hose is, is impeding the flow of the water. It isn't doing any work, it isn't making anything get hot, it's just in the way. It's just reducing the current flow. In AC circuits, we call this reactance, stuff that impedes the flow of current. In the world of the water hose, there's only one kind of reactance, my hand squeezing. Uh, but with AC circuits, there's actually two kinds, as the slide shows, but both impede current flow. Both things are measured ultimately in ohms, and like my hand and the sprinkler head, both can exist simultaneously. The spigot doesn't know what's slowing the flow of the water, my hand or the sprinkler head or something else, but some combination of them shows up as an impedance to the flow of the water. Similarly, resistance and reactance components of the signal through an antenna show up ultimately as impedance. So, we have resistance, which is typically symbolized by an R. Reactance, typically symbolized by an X. You may see that on some of your antenna analyzers. R is typically zero or a positive number, and X can be zero positive or negative. Now, Inductive reactance is considered positive, and capacitive reactance is considered negative. You can have both inductive and capacitive reactance in a circuit, by the way, and those things can cancel each other out, uh, partially or totally. So when we talk about the reactance that we see, it's the net reactance between capacitive and inductive reactance in the circuit. Calculating impedance is a little more involved than just adding two numbers together. To compute the impedance, you must put the resistance on the horizontal axis of the graph, then you put the reactance on the graph, starting with the endpoint of the resistance, and then finally you determine the total impedance by measuring the hypotenuse of the resulting triangle. In this example, 40 ohms of resistance, along with 30 ohms of capacitive reactance, results in 50 ohms of total impedance. Note that the feed point impedance is sometimes referred to as Z0. Just a little math note here maybe for extra credit. The graph we just showed you is actually called a complex plane and has real numbers along the x-axis and imaginary lump numbers along the vertical axis. You don't need to know this to do calculations if you just use the graphical approaches that I described. Uh, I just wanted to be able to recognize how these things are represented in NEC. Although you can't add resistance and reactance directly with simple addition, you can use simple addition when combining multiple reactance values. Again, we use the graphical approach. This is really handy when we're doing feed point impedance matching. As I said, a circuit might have both inductive and capacitive uh, values, uh, characteristics, and so what we worry about is the net impedance between the two. So in order to find the net, we need to be able to add them. To do this, you need to know the magnitude and direction for the vectors. The direction is dictated by the kind of reactance, capacitive or inductive, and the magnitude of the vector is determined by the amount of reactance. So as you can see from uh, the, the slide, we have two reactances together and we get a net reactance. In the example above, I chose some value C for the capacitive reactance and some other value D to be the inductive reactance. In this case, C and D were the same, say 30 ohms of capacitive reactance and 30 ohms of inductive reactance. Since the two values were equal in magnitude but opposite in the direction, we ended up with a zero net reactants for the system. A lot of antenna matching strategy is done doing figuring like this. This is totally extra credit. This is if you wanted to know how these things are computed. I'll leave the slide in the deck so you can look at it later if you wish. Our antennas present us with a total feed point impedance of Z. It's usually what we want, we usually want this to be 50 ohms, and it's made up of a number of components. There's radiation resistance, this is the good stuff, this is the resistance to the power we try to put through the antenna because it's doing the work of creating RF energy. We'd love it if all of the feed point impedance was because of radiation resistance. 
Ohmic loss uh, from the resistance in the wire and other components is also present. For example, 100 feet of 16 gauge wire has about 4 tenths of an ohm of resistance. Well, it isn't much, but it isn't zero. There's also losses from the ground. The ground's involved in, in, if it's close enough, it's part of your antenna system, and this will inject some losses into your system. And there's all sorts of other losses that you can have, like if you've got a balun or a transformer in the system for matching, that could induce a loss. Uh, loading coils induce a loss and so on. Reactance of, this, of the antenna produces a particular value x at a given frequency and this is also measured in ohms. So the total impedance is the sum of all these items, the radiation resistance, all the losses, and whatever the, in, uh, whatever the reactance, uh, net reactance is. All right, resident antenna is defined to be an antenna where the total value of x is equal to zero. That's pretty nice. So all we are left with is radiation resistance and loss. That's the total impedance. And when we talk about antenna efficiency, the Radiation resistance uh, is due to work putting the signal out into space, and all the less, all the rest of the stuff is just losses, one way or another. The radiation resistance, the the total of the radiation resistance, the losses, and the uh, and the uh, net reactance, all those, the whole impedance, the ratio of what we use to put signal out and the total impedance is our efficiency. So as you can see. We compute efficiency very much like we computed uh, the com uh, total impedance of the feed point. So here's an example of how to compute the efficiency. Uh, we have 30 ohms of capacitive reactance, 40 ohms of real resistance, and let's just assume for a second that that's all radiation resistance, which results in a feed point impedance of 50 ohms, which is great, but we divide the re radiation resistance by the total impedance and you get the efficiency. In this case it's 80%. Okay, look at that again. We want 50 ohms, and we got 50 ohms, and that gives us a 1 to 1 SWR. That's great, right? Well, no. A low SWR does not mean necessarily that the antenna is efficient. In fact, in this example, the antenna is only 80% efficient. Note that good dipoles are more like 96% efficient. So, the goals for our antenna, we, should want, we want high efficiency, and we want the antenna to be a good match for our radio. Let's talk about antenna modeling software finally. Okay, EasyNEC is a collection of programs, one of our programs that provides a nice user experience to do this kind of antenna modeling work. It has an engine hidden behind the scenes, this NEC2 engine that performs all the calculations. When you input your data for the model, you're providing input for this calculation engine. Uh, NEC2 is the name of the engine. There was no NEC1, so that's a little confusing. Uh, there are other engines, including NEC4, but we'll just be using NEC2. It's free and it's open source, and it's, uh, it's, it's good for the kind of stuff that we do in HF. There are a lot of good modeling articles and books out there that'll be helpful for learning how to best feed the engine. I would just caution you before you start using Easy NEC that you understand the, the limitations of it. Uh, you should also get the latest patch release to make sure it's using the latest one. Why live with bugs that other people have found that's already been fixed? There are three versions of NEC. There's free, there's a $100 version, and there's $150 version. The biggest difference between these programs is the number of segments that the program can handle. I'll look at segments here in the middle, but there are limitations. By the way, if you want a copy of Easy NEC, you don't want to bother going to the website. If you own the antenna book, it's on the CD in the back. And there's also a couple chapters on antenna modeling in the book as well. Now, CocoNEC is a antenna analyzer program for the Macintosh. It's developed by a fellow named Coke Chen. He's developed a lot of really cool software for the Mac. It also uses NEC2. Uh, I guess it can also use NEC4. I've not done it, but uh, with some effort you can do that. Uh, it uses the same computation engine as EasyNEC. You get the same results, though the program might display them a little differently. So we'll do both. All right, let's talk about how they work. Consider the wire of a dipole. We give our modeling software a hand by dividing up each wire into segments. We specify the number of segments we want, and then the program cuts the wire up into even lengths with that many segments. Again, the free version of EasyNet can handle 20 segments. Paid version handles many more. CocoNet handles a large number of segments. I don't, I don't know how many. I don't think I've ever bumped into the limit. 
Uh, from the above, we can see that the model asked for five segments. The center segment has the most current flowing through it. The next two outer segments, numbers two and four, have some, but not as much. And finally, the two outside segments have hardly any. Okay, so when in doubt, when I'm doing a dipole, I choose an odd number of segments. Here's the magic. This is how the program works. The NEC2 engine takes the geometry of the antenna and figures out how much each of those segments contributes to the signal. It does this for every point surrounding the antenna. That's a lot of computations, but the computers are good at this, and it makes thousands or millions of calculations. It only takes a handful of seconds to complete. Now, once it's done, the NEC2 engine has produced a ton of data. Well, now the trick is showing us mortal users uh, a way that we can understand it, and that's the nice thing about these modeling programs, is they give us a nice user experience. We can ask the modeling program to give us a look at the model of the antenna in wire form. Both EasyNEC and CocoNEC results are shown for the next couple of slides so you get some idea of what the program can produce. Uh, you can see the dipole's extents. You can also see the feed point as a circle or a couple of circles in the center. EasyNEC also gives you a set of XYZ axes to get some idea of the placement of the antenna in space. We can see how well the antenna is matched to our generator, usually expecting 50 ohms, but you can change that. EasyNEC and CocoNEC give you nice SWR charts, and CocoNEC also shows de uh, data in what's called a Smith chart, which is a very handy thing. I'll cover this chart in more detail when we do the second night of antenna modeling. But the main idea is you can see whether or not your antenna matches better than 2 to 1 by seeing if it's plotted this resistance along this line and reactance along these curved lines are within this circle. This is the SWR 2 to 1 circle. Any, if you, all of your points plotted for the frequencies that you care about are within this circle, then the whole antenna will be within 2 to 1. All of these are within the 2 to 1 range SWR. This one's fallen just a little bit out. This is just a big piece of curved graph paper. Getting back to the antenna modeling software features, both programs give you a nice 3D view of the antenna, uh, of the signal intensity. So think of this as a balloon, uh, a nice spherical balloon, it's full of air. Where the balloon's poofed out, we have more signal than average in that direction, and where the balloon is less than what a sphere would present, we have less signal, relatively speaking. There's only so much power, just like there's only so much volume in a balloon. And the far field plot gives you some indication where the maximum power is pointed. Here I'm only going to show the CocoNeck output, but they're basically the same between CocoNeck and EasyNeck. Both programs will show you a slice of either the azimuth or elevation plots. You can see the characteristic dipole pattern in the azimuth plot, and the elevation plot shows a lot of signal going straight up. This is, this is the horizon. That's straight up. Look at all this signal going straight up. That's because I've modeled a 40 meter antenna and I've hung it too low. If you hang an antenna too low, sprays a lot of end, uh, sprays a lot of uh, radiation up where no one can hear it. Uh, we mentioned takeoff angle. That's the angle where most of the radiation is re emitted. Uh, in the elevation plot, we can see this. I've added uh, some red lines here to give you some idea where the maximum bulge is for those lobes, and it's up about 30, 40 degrees. Uh, I've shown it here like this. It's pretty high. Again, that's because the antenna was hung too low. Now here's one other thing you need to know in order to read these graphs. Uh, you should understand what the lines mean. The graphs, like azimuth and elevation plots, are plotted with power contours represented in decibels. Uh, and a decibel is just a way to show a power relationship. Uh, in the case of the graphs, they're saying a power relationship from the maximum. So the relationship of one power to another, they use log 10 of the ratio of the two powers and then multiply it by 10. So a factor of 10 ends up being 10 dB, 10 decibels. A factor of 2, like 10 watts versus 5 watts, ends up being log 10 of 2. You multiply that times 10, you get 3, roughly. dB units are handy because they can represent a very large difference in power compactly, which is very handy for these graphs. So let's look at one of these graphs just to see. We can see that the lines for the plots are marked in decibels. The outermost 0 dB semicircle means down 0, if, or, the, or it's the maximum. Uh, it's the maximum power. You need to read the small print at the bottom to see what that power actually is. 
The remainder of the semicircles are plotted as a relationship to that power. 5 dB down from that power, 10 dB down from the maximum would be, uh, a, t uh, would be a tenth. Uh, 50 dB down, that tiny, tiny semicircle down, would be something like 10 thousandths of the power. For any angle, you can see where the plot intersects the power lines to know how much power versus the maximum is going out at that angle. So let's look at some actual results from EasyNeck, or from uh, Coconut, actually, uh, or both. Remember when I said Coconut can throw a lot of numbers at you? Here's a bunch of numbers, so let's break it down. Coconut was run against this 40-meter dipole, and I asked for five different frequencies between 7 and 7.3 megahertz. Those frequencies are listed at the top. The next five lines give us the feed point impedance at each of those frequencies, so let's break that down. Just look at the top line here this line, this line right here. Z is the impedance, it's uh, the real part is 55.49 and the imaginary part, the reactance part, is 28.858 ohms. These are both in ohms. Remember when I said that reactance is actually a complex number? That's why we have the I there. So the real component is 55.49 and the reactive component is 28.858. And Resistance and reactance, of course, can live simultaneously. Now, because the inductive, uh, because the reactance is negative, it's capacitive. Had it been positive, it would have been inductive. And at the end, we see what the uh, voltage standing wave ratio is, and it says uh, if you're expecting 50 ohms, and I didn't tell it anything differently, so it defaults to that. It's 1.7 to 1 at 7 megahertz. The first frequency corresponds to this first line. We can tell a lot by this one line. For example, at 7 megahertz, the antenna is just a little short. Short antennas have capacitive reactants, and that's another tidbit you should go ahead and file away. Let's do some modeling. If you specify, th you specify things in x, y, z positions, so it might be time to get out the graph paper and the ruler. EasyNeck has this concept of wires but don't be too hung up on that term. Wires in this context just means conductor and an antenna. They can be made of copper, aluminum, they can be made of tubes or solid wire or stranded wire. You specify the elements, the extents of the wires, and then you specify the diameter for the size. The ends of the wire are specified in three space, where Z is the height, uh, and at XYZ. And at 40 meter dipole, we've been playing with is easy. So let's look at the matrix. Along with the XYZ information, we also specify the number of segments we want our program to cut this wire into, and we specify the size of the wire. We also need to say someplace what the wire is made of, copper or aluminum or something. So this one goes from minus 34 feet uh, up at 40 feet to, and the other side is at plus 34 feet. So that's a total of 68 feet centered around zero, up also up 40 feet. So it's nice and flat, up 40 feet. 68 feet long. We want to cut into 11 segments and we're going to use number 16 wire with it. You can select the units of measure, inches, feet, meters, etc. Uh, in certainly in CocoNeck uh, at least. It will respect the suffix at the end of the number. Here I used a tick mark to mean feet. So going back to EasyNeck, EasyNeck has a main window from which you'll do all your work. There are menus along the top and there's handy buttons along the left side. There's also quick access to the data you're likely to need to do the modeling, starting with the frequency, wires, the sources of your signal, and so on. So click the button immediately to the left of these items to change them. For example, click on the little button next to wire loss and it will allow you to select the materials the wires are made of. In this case, I'm using copper wires. Using the spreadsheet-like entry form, uh, you can u enter these wires one at a time. For a dipole, we only have one wire, so it's easy. We use the geometry we worked out before, and we walk through the matrix here. It's minus 34 feet, uh, up at 40 feet, plus 34 feet, up at 40 feet, number 16, wire diameter, and 11 segments, just like we had in the other matrix. So this is exactly what the program needs to know in order to do the modeling. Okay, need to tell it a few other things here. We can click the View Antenna button to see if the antenna we've described uh, looks right. It's good to check to make sure the shape of the things you want were realized in the dimensions. If you had an error in the geometry, everything else is going to be nonsense. So if I click the View Antenna button, it should give me a very nice view of the antenna. 
Uh, it's sitting up in Z. Uh, it's extending between negative and positive in X. And EasyNet will even let you grab this image and spin it around to see it from different perspectives, which is handy when you're doing uh, Yagi's and things that have some shape. You need to set the frequency. This number gets used for far field plots. The SWR plots are made from a frequency range you, you do later. You need to drive this antenna with some kind of power. So you specify the power source for that power uh, in the Sources tab. We're just going to feed this thing in the middle with current. So it looks something like this. When you press that button, it brings up a little spreadsheet that allows you to specify where and how to drive the antenna. Note that I use the amplitude of 1 uh, since I just want things to be displayed in some unit measure. And the type is current is I. So it's a good time to talk about feed points. Note that our dipole recreated this thing out of one wire. In the real world, there would have been two wires, typically, one connected to the center conductor of your coax and the other one connected to the shield, but EasyNEC only has one wire. How come? This was just a design decision by the guys that made the software. By specifying the feed point in the geometry, EasyNEC knows where the brake should go in between the two sides. It inserts a minuscule gap and drives the antenna just the way you might guess. So don't overthink this. Just think of it as, this is where I'm going to put my feed point when I construct the antenna in EasyNEC and Coconut and the NEC2 engine will just figure it out. So again, look at the matrix. We feed this antenna in one place. If we had a dipole array, we might drive more than one wire, but in this case we specify the wire we wish to drive, which is the only one we have, and the position along the wire where we'd like the feed point. Because NEC has rules about where, this, where in the segment these brakes can exist, the actual position might differ from your wishes slightly, but the program will show you what it's using. Easy NEC is going to the NEC engine wants to put a wire in the middle of one of these segments. Let's look at the SWR for this thing. It's the first thing we model. I click the SWR button. It says, well, let's put the frequency range in. I gave it 7, 7.3, and step by 50 kHz. And it gives me a nice graph. That's a little over 2 to 1. It goes a little over 3 to 1 at the end of the band. So I'm sure we could do better. We can look at all sorts of different plots. Uh, this brings up a dialog box when I plus, press plot type uh, for azimuth elevation or three-dimensional. Let's look at a three-dimensional plot. Well, this 3D plot of the far field pattern for the antenna, looking at the antenna from many wavelengths away, it isn't a nice bow tie or hourglass like you'd expect from a dipole that's hung properly. This is the sort of thing you see when the dipole is too low. It's just a blob with a lot of energy going up. There's, uh, you can look at azimuth plots and let's look at the elevation plot though. This is what's really interesting. Notice how much energy is directed straight up where it's going to just be lost. Also, the angle that comes out of here, where it intersects the power, you can see how far down it is. So example, we're at this angle, we're down 10 dB or we're a tenth of the power we put out. So if we're 100 watts, we're only putting out 10 watts worth of power at this angle. This angle is even worse. It's only one watt. 20 dB is a factor of 100, so one one hundredth of 100 watts is one watt, one watt for this thing at that angle. So that's how you read these plots. Now I mentioned that ground is actually uh, affecting the antenna for these things. You can specify the kind of ground by clicking on the ground type. Uh, I've just been using real ground and then for the ground description, you can select something that you want. I'd been using average. Uh, for New England, it's probably better to use something like this poor Rocky Mountainous. You might even be sandy or dry, but this is probably a better choice for New England. We don't have great... This, If you lived in a big 100-year floodplain like Illinois or Iowa or something, it would be this one. All right, so let's fix the problem. We saw that the plot, we saw from the plots that the dipoles hung too low, so let's raise it up and see if things get better. This is all I have to do. I'm only going to change these two numbers. This is all I changed. I just changed the Z, the height. It was at 40 feet, now it's at 66 feet. That's all I've changed. So let's run the model again. Well, now when I look at the SWR, it looks a lot better. It's all under 3 to 1. So it's down less than 1.5 to 1. So that looks better. 
Oh, that looks lots better. The far field plot is a big improvement. We no longer spraying lots of energy up. Instead, we're sending it out broadside to the antenna, largely. I mean, it's not great. Look at uh, an elevation plot, and it's still, uh, it's still pretty high. The maximum is way up here, about 45 degrees. In fact, I can read that. The maximum elevation angle is 45 degrees. That's the maximum gain. That's pretty high for a dipole, so it's probably still not hung high enough. But it's a whole lot better than it was. Also, remember when I said that there's not go a lot going on at the end of a dipole? Not a lot of current flow, and without current flow, you don't have any signal flow. I can click on the currents button, and I end up with something like this. And I can see that in the middle, I have the full amount of current. But by the time I get out to the ends, the end segments, I've only got about 15% of, of the original current flowing. That's not very much current flowing, so there's not a lot of signal coming out of the ends of the dipole. Let's do the same thing in Cocoa Neck. In Cocoa Neck and Easy Neck, you use the same engine, so you have to supply all the same kinds of information, and it presents the information a little differently, but it's the same results if you give it the same numbers. So here, uh, Cocoa Neck, when you say give me a new model, it gives you a nice spreadsheet that you can put in the wires extents. So we did, it's the same numbers, I left it at 40 feet, minus 34 at 40 to plus 34 at 40, and I used, I think that's number 16 in 11 segments. I double click on the wire to be driven because I need to be able to tell it how I'm going to excite this this antenna, excitation, big $20 word here. Current source, and I say it's, again, I use the, uh, it's, I say it's current and I'm going to give it a value of one, just some unit current, and I drive it in the center. All right, clicking the environment button allows you to set some things like uh, the frequency range that we're going to use for our SWR. I'm just like the other one, I'm going to start at 7, go to 7.3, do it in five, uh, in 5 steps, and I can specify ground, good ground, average ground, poor ground, that kind of thing. And when I press run, I get this. It looks a lot, this one certainly looks a lot like the other plot that we had from Easy Neck. We also get this Smith chart thing. Remember, this is the 2 to 1 circle. Of these nine tabs, I get nine different views of the data from this antenna. The SWR circle, that's two, this is the 2 to 1 circle right here, so the antenna is mostly 2 to 1. Just one little point outside of it. One of the nice things about doing modeling is that you can take an existing model and make changes to it to see what the effects might be. We're going to take that 40 meter dipole that we've been playing with and slide the feed point off to one side. Just make a copy of the original antenna model and rename it to what we're doing next. So dipoles can be fed almost anywhere. The feed point can be in the center, it can be off center, or you can be very close to the end. Now the impedance goes up as you move off center. So feeding at the end becomes very hard because the impedance is very high, but there are end-fed antennas. They have a special circuit to feed the thing at that end. So the 40 meter dipole at 66 feet, OCF, off-center fed. It's the same antenna we modeled before. The only thing I'm going to change is I'm going to slide the feed point off to one side. I'm also going to pretend like we've got a 4 to 1 ballon on it. You do this by using an alternate Z0, Z0, to say, well, I will not expecting 50 ohms now, I'm going to expect 200. And that will be what the ballon sees. And the ballon will translate what it sees into something your radio can use. Changing the feed point position doesn't change the shape of the far field pattern. The far field pattern of the antenna is by the dimensions, not by where you feed it. So I'm going to make a copy of the 40 meter center fed model to begin this one. And really all I do is I'm just going to go to the sources, open up that open up that uh, little spreadsheet. Instead of having this be 50% from end one, I'm just going to say 25% from end one. And what this does is it ends up putting it about 22.7% from end one at some place in the middle of the third segment. Uh, Easy Neck wants to, the Neck engine wants to put the feed point in the middle of a segment. So it's close, close enough, close enough to give us the interesting numbers we're looking at. I also click this alternate SWR Z0 and I say let's make that 200. So now 
when I do a SWR view, I click this radio button and it says, ah, tell me what it would be if assuming 200. And it gives me this nice SWR plot. So it looks pretty good at 200. And if I say view the antenna, we can actually see that the feed points off to the off to one end. Let's do an inverted V. An inverted V is just a dipole, but the arms aren't flat. They're angled towards the ground. I can't have bends in wires. Neck, the neck two engine doesn't allow you to have a bend in the wire. So I, now I have to have two wires and we specify a new source for the feed point. So we start at the 40 meter dipole at 66 feet as the baseline and then we edit it. So now we're going to want to have two wires and this is how it looks. We go into the wires and sources tabs and we the first wire we say alright starts at minus 23 feet and 40 feet up and it meets in the middle at 0, 0 at 66 feet. This is a little lower than that, so it's up at an angle. The other one comes from the other direction. It's 23 feet up, I'm sorry, 23 feet out, up at 40 feet, and it angles up to 0, 0 at 66 feet. And look, we've even got connections here. The first wire is connected to wire 2, N2, and the second wire is connected to wire 1, N2. So we can verify that these two things are connected. When we click the sources, we now have to say that well, it's 100% from the first end of wire 1. That is, you know, the end of... Uh, we want it on the other end. We want it close to the middle. It does the best it can. There's 11 segments, so it puts it almost there. This is plenty good enough for doing modeling. And it's not quite as good as the nice big flat top that we have, but it's not bad. Let's look at the pattern. No my. It's, we're back to the blob. So what happened? Well, the dipole arms are no longer horizontal and flat. Instead, they angle towards the ground with the ends only at about 40 feet. So the average height of the antenna is lower than with the flat top, and the antenna itself is now hung too low. So this awful bubble pattern that has lots of energy going straight up into space is lost forever. But in most circumstances, we don't want our signal to go up. We want it to go out, so we probably should change some things. But uh, at least you know what this thing is going to look like. So using the view antenna feature we can see how low the antenna arms are. This is what we wanted and we modeled it correctly but the antenna has a much higher takeoff angle than the flat top and it puts a lot of the energy straight up. So when you're planning your antennas there's almost always going to be some kind of trade-off. Antenna modeling allows you to understand the implications of every decision and therefore hopefully helps you make good choices. Let's make a whole different kind of an antenna. Let's make a quarter wave vertical monopole. Well, it's a quarter wave vertical. It, we need some radials. We'll do 16. Uh, verticals like this have a characteristic impedance of about 37 ohms under the best circumstances, but probably we won't get all that because we things aren't going to be perfect. But we may have more losses, so please don't be fooled into thinking that things are efficient just because you get a feed point impedance closer to 50 ohms. If if this is the very best we can do, and that's the feed point impedance, then you can see we've got 13, we've got 13 ohms of loss. What is that going to do to the efficiency? Well, 13 ohms is about a third of that, so our efficiency is under 70%, just eyeballing it. So the geometry of this thing is pretty interesting. Remember I told you that Coconut wants, uh, that the NEC2 engine wants you to feed a segment in the middle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a tiny little segment tiny little wire. It goes from 0 to 7.9 inches. That's just one wire. I'm going to say it has three segments. I'm not sure it matters. And I'm going to say it's not a very big little wire. It's just tiny. I, could have, I should have made it the same as the radius of the other thing, but it doesn't matter much. The other one starts where this one ends, and it goes up to 33 and a half feet. Okay quarter wave vertical for 40 meters. I excite the second wire in the center so that'll feed it very close to the ground. Here's a trick. I click the environment button 
I get the environment panel. Now we click the radials tab. We haven't been here before. I say I want NEC2 radials. NEC2 knows how to make radials. I say I want them 34 feet in length using the number 12 wire and I want 16 of them. And that's all I need to say. And the program will do the right thing. And this is in fact what the output looks like. This is pretty good. We run the model and we get the expected vertical antenna far field pattern of two nice big lobes with, little, with very little energy going up. So this looks this looks terrific. Coconut gives you a nice 3D model, 3D pattern of what the far field pattern looks like. Notice a nice hole in the donut so that there's no energy going up, it's just all going out. It's wonderful. Smith charts, this is the 2 to 1 thing. I, I, I put the feed point impedances at the various frequencies where we tried it. You can see that you know it goes from 2 to 1 down to about a 1.8 to 1. But they're all within this circle. This is the 2 to 1 circle. So what you can do, once you've got something working like this, is you can play with it. And this is where it gets fun. You can add more radials, you can change the length of the radials, you can change the length of the radiator, you can change the, the, dyna the diameter of the radiator, you can change the, the ground, you can change all sorts of things and see what it does and it's just a quick change and run it again. This is what makes modeling really fun. Let's do a 43 foot vertical. This is a really popular antenna uh, because it covers all the bands. And one of the reasons why it covers all the bands is because it's very carefully chosen at a length where it's never close to a half wave on any hand band. A half wave antenna is very difficult to feed at the end. The impedance is very high. So if you stay away from that, we should be able to feed it uh, with current. It is a monopole, not a dipole, so it needs a radial field. and Typically the antenna is matched with a 4 to 1 or a 9 to 1 balance. We'll just tell NEC that we're expecting a 200 ohm feed point impedance and we'll see if this... Uh, and we, you'll still need an antenna tuner for this. So I do the same sort of trick. I make a very short little... a very short little wire, just one segment. It's only about, you know, 0.1 foot long. It's connected to the second wire, which starts where the first one ends, and it goes up 43 feet. So I'm going to feed myself with this wire, th with the first one. The third wire is a prototype or archetype of the radial wire. So I'm going to put out one single radial, and then I'm going to ask the program to make a bunch of radials. I go to the wires menu, I use create radials, and then I tell it I want 16 radials. So I start, it says, what's the first wire in the radial group? Well, we're only going to use one one wire as our prototype, so it's three and three. Give me 16 radials. You maybe had, you could have had two wires in this group. One that was out 30 feet and another one out 60 feet and have them alternate. Give me 16 like that and it would have alternated those. So that's pretty clever. But just by pressing the button, holy Toledo, look at all the wires we got now. So the program just automatically made <laughs> all these wires. Look at all the segments too. That's way more than 20, so you're probably not going to be able to do this with the free version of Easy Neck. All right, always verify the antenna geometry. We do this by clicking on the View Antenna button, and you can see all the little radials laying on the ground, and then the big wire that we have going up. So let's see what this thing looks like. Here I've done something kind of fun. I've plotted several bands on one chart. I'll show you how to do this if we have a night two. Dark, the black, is for 10 meters. And you can see it's kind of a weird, almost looks like a butterfly. It's got weird lobes and very high takeoff angle and so on. This antenna is really long for 10 meters and for 12 meters. Even at 15, uh, even at 15 meters, 21 megahertz, it's still got a very high takeoff angle, although at least the lobes are kind of normal looking. It isn't until you go down to, say, 40 meters that the thing starts behaving like a good vertical antenna. So you definitely have trade-offs when you've got a 43-foot vertical. And in this case, I used an, S, uh, I used an alternative SWR as 200. I could have used a 9 to 1 ballon here and just told us it was 450. And maybe I should have done that. But here you can see the at 80 meters it's very tough. You're going to need a pretty big loading coil to get this in the neighborhood. And now we've got 
I don't know, the SSWR is about 8 to 1 here, so you need to have a good auto tuner. This is a really good antenna to have a remote tuner, one right at the feed point, and uh, let it figure it out. Let's build one more. A halfway vertical dipole for 20 meters. This one's really fun. Now, it would normally be 33 feet long, you know, plus it'd have to be mounted off the ground, but we're going to make this one much shorter by adding capacity hats. These are capacity hats. Look at the diagram. We have vertical antenna with two horizontal elements crossing at the ends like wings. So these are the capacity hats. It's going to be a lot smaller because of it. So I'm going to do this one in Coco Neck because I want to show off something that Coco Neck does that I'm not sure Easy Neck does. I can make variables. I click this thing and I want it to say, I want to describe this antenna, I really only need to have three pieces of information. Where does the, where's the bottom of the antenna? How high is it off the ground? Where's the top of the antenna? And how wide are the wings? Then what I do is I just plug those values, those variables, into the spreadsheet. And now if I want to make changes, I just need to change the variables. And it changes them in all the right places. I put the radius as about one inch. I'm making this out of uh, aluminum tubes. And I say that there's 11 segments. Now when I run it, oh, I'm sorry, I need to excite it. I excite the, I double click on the part of the antenna that's the center, the big center section. I drive it again with current source one in the center. And when I click verify geometry, let's look at this. We say that, uh, that not a lot happens at the end of a dipole. Well, Cocoa Neck, and Easy Neck for that matter, give you a nice indication of where all the current, where the maximum current is. You see the maximum current here in the middle, and it gets lower, and then there's almost nothing going on at the capacity hats. The colors show you the distribution. I think this is a little like a droopy dipole on its side with an extra wire. It has a terrific match. Look at that. Very, very close. Right dead center in the middle of the 2 to 1 band. And in fact, uh, here are some of the frequencies. I think I did this for seven different frequencies, and they're all somewhere between 1.4 to 1 and 1.1 to 1. Very good, very good matches. That is the end of night one. Thank you very much for coming, for being patient and listening, and uh, we'll assess the uh, we'll assess the interest in having a night two. There's lots of great stuff we can do.